so what, what I'd like to kind of do is is maybe look at some uh, dietary, well, I guess biomarkers, particularly HDL and LDL. Um, and so, is, and how you think about them and, and maybe kind of related to the diet. So, so actually within the book, so one of the things you said was that LDL uh, kind of mops up LPS. So do you see like having a higher, but I guess there's a number of questions, but one is, do you track, I'm sure you track LDL, but do you see LDL on its own as being a, a key marker or is it the relation it has with HDL that, that's kind of the most important? And then um, kind of what target do you go for, for, for LDL? And do you think as you get older, it's important to have the LDL out there to uh, kind of maybe restrict the LPS? Yeah. So uh, I've got a few things to say about that story. And this is perfect timing because my, probably my next video I've been working on it is going to be on LDL in terms of what's optimal for aging and longevity. And uh, a few videos ago, I made one on HDL. So mm. um, it's a very timely story. But before I get into the, the lipoprotein story, along the lines of LPS is, is a, um, an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase. So I, I, I have this data too in the book that... Um, Alkaline phosphatase's main job is to remove phosphate groups. So actually LPS has phosphate groups. And in the intestine, alkaline phosphatase acts to dephosphorylate LPS, thereby inactivating it. So you want to have high intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity to uh, inhibit LPS in the gut. Now, uh, further along that story, uh, Alkaline phosphatase increases lifespan in mice. And I've got that information in the book too. And I actually made a video on that if anybody wants to uh, check it out. Um, so how can you optimize intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity? So uh, the, I also present data in the book that uh, vitamin K1 has been shown to do that. And vitamin K1, also known as phylloquinone, you can get that from you know green leafy vegetables. So I shoot for you know a very high amount of K1 so that I can optimize my intestinal alkaline phosphatase to potentially uh, limit how much LPS is active in my gut. That should limit how much gets into the blood and all those things. Um, vitamin D has been shown to increase uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity. So those are just a couple of ways. I may have other ways in the book, but those are the two main ways. Uh, uh, butyrate. Also, I think butyrate, um, with the short chain fatty acid butyrate, which is produced by the gut bacterial fermentation of soluble fiber. Uh, so again, it goes into the you know green leafy vegetables, high soluble fiber foods, vitamin D, potentially would increase things like alkaline phosphatase, which will limit these LPS containing bacteria and inhibit the activity of LPS. So these are, these are things that you would want. Now, I'm not saying to completely wipe out all of the LPS containing bacteria in the gut. I don't think that's possible, but uh, alkaline phosphatase, intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity declines during aging. So when you consider that there's an increase in LPS containing bacteria, E. coli being one example uh, in the gut during aging, and it's been shown that there's an increase in LPS in the blood during aging, you want to have your L intestinal alkaline phosphatase activity. Uh, you want to have good levels of that, right? So um, that's why I mentioned, you know, those ways, uh, you know, through fiber and, and, and vitamin K1 and, and vitamin D. Now, in terms of the lipoprotein story, um, so in terms of HDL, for men, it's somewhere in the 55 milligrams per deciliter uh, is optimal. And when, when I say optimal, uh, that's in terms of uh, how, how uh, I think there's a meta-analysis of, I don't remember how many subjects, but it's in the, one of the videos that I just recently mm -hmm. made, uh, uh, maybe a million or so subjects, where lowest risk of death for all causes was somewhere in the 55 uh, range for men, and I think somewhere around 60 for women. So, um, but that data, the all-cause mortality data was up to subjects who are about 80 years old. So then I looked at all, you know, as many centenarian studies as I could find, and, you know, so, um, so the 55 or so 55 to 60 range, uh, is still found in the centenarians, but when you get to semi and super centenarians, which is 105, 110 plus now HDL is less. So in the forties range, so that to me suggests that, uh, having higher, you know, HDL in the 55 to 60 range is probably good for longevity. And then at the, towards the end of life, because if you're at 105 or 110 years old, you're literally at almost at the edge of life, uh, it falls. So um, now along those lines, my HDL is 
uh, over the last five years in 25 plus measurements. You know, if for, for people who saw my bio hacking uh, videos, I, I track this stuff five, five or so, five to six times a year, four to six times a year. So yeah, my HDL uh, is uh, it averages around 44. So I'm actively trying to raise my HDL through diet. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, there are certain correlations between certain foods. So I'm trying to increase those foods uh, and, and uh, with the goal of getting my HDL consistently above, you know, 52, 53, which is where I've gotten to in the past. So along those lines, my HDL can be as low as 28 and as high as 56. So um yeah, so I think that's an important part of the 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 the, the lipoprotein story. Now, HDL also binds to LPS. Um, I can't remember if it inactivates it, but it's involved in that process. So if you don't have a lot of HDL, that would weaken your ability to uh, you know um, inactivate systemic LPS. Similarly, LDL has a role in that process too, where it binds to LPS. Now, what's optimal in terms of that? And again, this is timely because I'm making a video on it. Uh, relatively soon. So in older adults, um, it's actually been shown that having uh, higher than what's, you know, uh, commonly reported as, you know, quote unquote optimal. So, you know, you hear this idea that lower LDL is better uh, and higher is bad. So for the LDL story and which tracks with the total cholesterol story, um, having LDL somewhere in the 140 range, it has been shown to be associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. Um, and that's in a couple of studies looking at 40 year olds and 60 year olds, average, you know, average ages. In older adults, uh, centenarians, they have LDL values around 120. So already this common, this, you know, this common perception that your LDL needs to be less than 100 may be false. And actually along those lines too, in two of those studies that I just mentioned, having LDL levels less than 100 was associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk compared with 120. Uh, around one, uh, an average of 120 to 140, somewhere in that range. So, and, and, you know, you could make the argument, well, reverse causality, the people who had lower LDLs of less than hundred uh, were sicker, whether it was cardiovascular disease or diabetes. And in these conditions, their LDL was lower. So that's why you see that associated with all cause mortality risk. But in at least two of those studies, they excluded subjects who had a history of heart disease or diabetes. And still we saw that they saw this association for LDL levels less than 100 being associated with an all-cause mortality risk. So for LDL, somewhere in the um, 120 to 140-ish range, somewhere in that, maybe optimal. Now, um, I also made a video on total cholesterol uh, in terms of what's optimal for that. So total cholesterol being the sum of LDL, HDL, VLDL, ILDL. Now, there isn't much data for IDL, intermediate density lipoprotein, and there's some data for VLDL in terms of what's optimal, at least how it changes during aging. But starting from what's optimal for total cholesterol, which has been shown in a study of 12 plus million subjects, you know, I'd look for the biggest studies possible on these, uh, in these areas, because if you have a study of, you know, 3,000 people, that might not be representative of the larger population. But if you've got a study that's got hundreds of thousands of subjects, now, you know, any effects that you do identify because you've got such large population sizes may be more closely reflective of the population average, right? So uh, for, for that study that had about 12 million subjects, um, total cholesterol in the 210 to 240 range was associated with lowest risk of all-cause mortality. So if, when you consider around 55 for HDL, 55 for men, 60 for women, so subtract 55 from that total. When you subtract about uh, 140 for LDL, so now you've got 155 and 140, 195. And then uh, somewhere in the VLDL range of lower being better, it increases during aging and the lower density lipoproteins aren't uh, good in terms of cardiovascular disease risk or atherosclerosis. So having somewhere around 15, that'll get the sum of just those three to around 210. So uh, I'd say that those are good ranges to shoot for, you know, uh, somewhere around 140 for LDL, 55 to 60 for men or women, respective men and women respectively, and then VLDL being around 15 or less and to get you to about that 210 um, total cholesterol with IDL being debatable, you know, how much, because there's so little data on it. Um, right, yes. So it was interesting, I, in Neil, Neil Barzilai's book, I mean, he mentioned that the centenarians like when they were younger, they had ridiculously high HDL, like over a hundred, which, oh. yeah. I, so, so that, so um, I'm going to have to go and take a look at his, at, at, at near studies because uh, I was looking at larger uh, sample sizes. So the, um, 
uh, long life family study. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the New England centenarian study, um, there were a few yeah. of the centenarian based studies. I think they had something like 3000. I don't remember the n number off the top of my head, but it was a few thousand centenarians in each of the different centenarian cohorts, the LDL values were in the mid fifties. Um, so I'm going to have to go take a look at his, uh, granted, it's hard to, you know, there aren't longitudinal studies for uh, people who ended up becoming centenarians. So one way they address that is by looking at the offspring of the centenarians, right? So, yeah. um, which goes into this idea of, you know, some of the semi and super centenarians that have values in the forties, their offspring have values in the high fifties on average. So mm. it's possible that they had values. Some of them had values close to hundred, but there's also data showing that having very high levels of HDL in some cases up to hundred is associated with uh, an increased all cause mortality risk. So there is a U shape, there is a U shape for the meta-analysis data on uh, HDL with too low being uh, an increased risk and also too high being with that sweet spot being somewhere in the, you know, like I said, the 55 to 60 uh, range. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I, so I'll see in the book if, if he references where, where, whether it was a study or where he saw that because he was doing that study. Um, so but I'm betting, I'm betting, I'm betting that he, you know, there, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but uh, I bet that the, the, the majority of centenarians didn't have a hundred for HDL their whole life. Maybe a few hit a hundred, but on average, right. So to get to that 55 or so average, that's been reported for people of around that age, you know, you can have a few that are at a hundred and a few that are around 40 to get you to that 55 ish, you know, normal right. distribution. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.